That's really not fair, is it? It's not. It's not fair. In fact, it's almost sort of offensive, isn't it? It reminds me of the prodigal son, where the, the elder son does everything right. He follows all of the rules his whole life long. And then this younger son comes back after spending all of his father, about 40% of his father's estate on wild living. And they kill the fatted calf, and the elder brother has to sit there while he hears the singing and the dancing and smells the smells of the meat roasting. It's not fair, is it? It wasn't fair 2,000 years ago, and it's not fair today. Jesus is telling us, let me have one more. This is a, a kind of our series on parables. Jesus is using this once again to tell us who God is. What is God? What is God like? What is the kingdom of heaven? And adding insult to injury, did you notice the ones who got there first, not only did they back-breaking labor work all day long, and then these loafers, shirkers, showed up in the last hour, did you notice the people that showed up at 5 in the afternoon get paid first? I mean, truly, everything is upside down, isn't it? Yeah. So if we're going to understand this, I always like to do this. If Jesus is telling me something that makes me uncomfortable, I look at what happened just before and what happened just after. So if we look at what just happens before, and we're bracketing this, so to speak. Just before, do you remember the story... Where Jesus, uh, the young ruler, comes up and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, uh, follow the law, follow Torah, honor your father and mother, blah, blah, blah. And the young man says, all of this I have done since birth. And then Jesus, as typical, zeroes in on the one thing that this person has a problem with. And says, sell everything that you have and come and follow me. And of course, the young man can't do it. And Peter pipes up just before this, and he says, hey, what about us? We've given up everything for you. We've left our home, we've left our families, our farms, our fishing businesses, and follow you. What's in, what's in this for us? And Jesus says, don't worry. You'll sit on 12 thrones uh, of Israel, judging Israel, but the last will be first, and the first will be last. And then right after this parable that we just read, or that I just read, Remember where James and John's mother come up to Jesus and says, I got a little favor I need to ask you. Can my two sons sit at your right and at your left? Still angling for what, what's in it for us? How do we get to be first? And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. My throne is not going to be made of gold. It's going to be made of wood and it's going to be made of nails. You don't know what you're asking. If you want to be first, you must first be the servant or slave of all. Then you will be first in the kingdom of heaven, because the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is Dipper Dan Ice Cream Parlor in Jacksonville, Florida. Remember the church I showed you, uh, the picture of my church at home? This is right across the street. It's right across the street from uh, the Presbyterian Day School that I went to. And uh, we don't have any kids here today, so I won't blow this uh, I don't know what it is, but if you're a teacher and you tell a bunch of second graders, you know, if you are good for the next six weeks, we'll take you for a 50 cent scoop of ice cream and you, we will police each other. You go bananas to get ice cream. And this was Dipper Dan. If we were really good, we got to go to Dipper Dan. We have one more. Where we stand in line outside Dipper Dan and it's Florida and it's hot and it's humid. And all us little kids sitting there panting and sweating. The good kids got to go to the front of the line. They were the ones, you remember those old things called SRA? They were like these little, you got, you, you would get to green. And then if you were even got more, you get to blue or whatever. Well, they got to be in the front of the line, you know. And they got to go, excuse me, go inside where it was nice and cool. Open that door and go in. And oh, Dipper Dan was so cold. Felt so good. Can you imagine? If the owner of Dipper Dan had come out and said, you know what, we're doing it different today. You kids in the front, just sit tight. All you kids in the back, we're going to start, we're going to start from the back today. Yeah. 
going to start from the back. That's not fair. You can't do that. You can't do that. When we're kids, we want to go to a, an authority figure, our mom or dad or whatever, and say, we're seeking justice. This isn't fair. She took my toy. He took my last piece of cake or whatever. And we expect that that authority figure is going to make things right, don't we? My sister and I hated this because my father used to say this all the time. We'd go with a complaint to my dad, and whether he was tired from a long day at work or he was just frustrated or whatever, you go and you plead your case, and you say, what? That's not fair. And my dad would say, get used to it. Life's not fair. Well, when you're 10, that's way uncool. And as we're older, we want to feel like God is the one that we can go to, an authority figure. That's the one person that we ought to be able to go to and say, hey, this isn't fair. You're going to make things right. But it seems like in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is telling us God doesn't do that. At least doesn't play by our rules. The vineyard is hot. It's dusty. It's backbreaking work on your knees and then standing up. These poor people at six o'clock in the morning, they have been there in the heat of the day all day long probably had very little to eat. By the end of the day, they're probably what my kids would call hangry. You heard of hangry, it's when you're hungry and angry, and the hungrier you get, the angrier you get. They're probably pretty hangry by the end of the day. So, our landowner, who is God in the parable, goes out again, doesn't he? At nine o'clock, at 12 o'clock, at three o'clock. And what does he say to them? He doesn't say, Go on out, I'll give you a denarius, which is pay for the day. I'll give you whatever is right. Then goes out at five o'clock. Our story as it progresses, it becomes pretty obvious that the purpose of the landowner is not that he needs laborers for the vineyard. The purpose of the story for God is that he wants everyone to come into the vineyard. And everyone who is invited said yes. And by the end of the day, it seems that God has gone in and gathered every person from the marketplace and brought them into the vineyard. It's not the amount of work that's important. It's join us in the vineyard. Sundown. It's time to get paid. We're hangry. We're hot. It's getting cold. This is actually a denarius, a Tiberius denarius, who was the emperor at the time of Jesus. And if you were a day laborer, you were paid typically a denarius for your pay for one day. And it was a little bit more than subsistence, but it was enough to where you could eat, you could sustain your life. You weren't going to, you know, you couldn't pay your cell phone bill, you know, you couldn't go out to dinner. Uh, that kind of thing, but you, you could put some food on the table and you could eat and you could survive another day. Everybody lines up. Actually, Tommy Johnson sent this picture to me and he said, can you believe the line at the Parma DMV these days? <laughs> so they all line up, don't they? And what happens? Folks in the back of the line, let me have my, yeah. Folks in the back of the line, they get a full denarius for an hour's work. There is some glad handing and some knuckle pumping, fist pumping and high fives. There's cheering. So the kids in, at the front of the line, what are they thinking? Oh my gosh, they've only been here an hour. And they got a full denarius. We're gonna be rich. And sure enough, what happens? The steward passes out one denarius each. All the air goes out of our balloon, doesn't it? No, yeah. It's just not fair, is it? And it's not. It's not fair. So they grumble against the landowner, don't they? And the landowner says, what? 
You agreed for a denarius this morning. What's your problem? Take what's yours and go. Are you grumbling with me because I am generous? You bet. You bet they are. And so are we, if you're like me. Yeah, that's not fair. Actually, that thing grumbling against and are you envious, there's another way in the Greek to interpret that that's kind of interesting. God is saying, in effect, are you putting the evil eye on me? Because ophthalmos is one of the words in there. It's kind of, I don't know, I'm a Bible geek, so I think that that's kind of interesting. I saw this when I was working in Washington, D.C., too, with government workers. And I have nothing against government workers, but if you're wearing a uniform, you work, however many hours a week you have to work till the job gets done. And we used to grumble because, you know what? There were these civilian workers, they could work 40 hours a week. If they worked 41, they got overtime. Um, you know, they, they got all these great deals. I saw people that were like the chief of staff for some mid-level functionary, but they, because they had been there for 16 years, they were getting paid $150,000 a year to manage someone's calendar. And you bet we grumbled, or I did. I've seen this, I've seen this in the hospital too. You've heard of this happening. Susie takes care of mom. She spends every nickel that she has and works her fingers to the bone taking care of mom till the bitter end. And then those rotten kids, the one that moved to California, you know him? The brother. And that sister that's in Toledo. And the other brother that's in Chicago. Sure, they show up at the very end of the hospital. And mom says, I'm leaving everyone exactly the same because I love you all just the same. And Susie, who spent all her money and all her energy taking care of mom, is kind of saying, you know what, that's not, that's really not fair. It's really not fair. When I was a kid, uh, my parents' friends used to, do you remember the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Yeah, so I mean, my, my parents' friends used to call me Ferris Bueller, and I don't know why, because I, I did actually get caught a lot. You know, uh, but it seemed like when I would get busted for doing something wrong, my dad would sort of send, the mom would sort of say, well, we're gonna punish you, we're gonna punish you. But I always found a way to talk my way out of it, or they just got, I just wore them down or whatever. And my sister, like Ferris's sister, Jeannie, really, it really got under her skin. She was the one that followed all the rules. She was the good girl, she still is. And I was the kid that was kind of always getting in trouble and seemed to get away with it. And you know what, it really just wasn't fair. I said it before and I'll say it again. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. What's so dangerous about a character like Ferris Bueller is he gives good kids bad ideas. Why should he get to skip school when everybody else has to go? Said the letter man Jesse. He never gets caught. This guy in my biology class said that if Ferris dies, he's giving his eyes to Stevie Wonder. He's very popular again. Jeannie's like, why should he get, he gets away with everything. And I follow the rules. Jeannie, uh, Jeannie right here is gonna, go ahead and just play. That's it. 
So the video, the volume wasn't great on that. But basically, she's like, you're letting him ditch school? He's not sick. It's not fair, is it? Ferris is going to spend the day having the time of his life in the singing in a parade, eating at fancy restaurants, driving his friend's father's Ferrari around. And his sister, Jeannie, as we'll see, she runs home during the day because she's going to bust him. She's going to bust him wide open and tell mom and dad. He's finally going to get what he deserves because he's not in bed and he's ditching school. Unfortunately, like always seems to happen with poor Jeannie, she goes home to bust Ferris and she ends up at the police station. I know what's wrong. Just want to hear you say it. In a nutshell, I hate my brother. How's that? That's cool. Did you blow him away or something? No, not yet. See, I went home to confirm that I was ditching school, and when I was there, a guy broke into the house. I called the cops, and they picked me up for making a funny phone call. So what do you care if your brother ditches school? Why should he get to ditch when everybody else has to go? You could ditch. Yes, I get caught. So you're pissed off because he ditches and doesn't get caught, is that it? Basically. Yes. And the problem is you. Excuse me? Excuse you. You want to spend a little more time doing with yourself, a little less time worrying about what your brother does. That's just an opinion. Mm. What, are you a psychiatrist? No. Why don't you keep your opinions to yourself? Somebody you should talk to. If you say Ferris Bueller, you lose a testicle. How oh, you know? Even the hood in jail knows her brother. He's so famous. I'm not normally in the, in the pattern of comparing Jesus' words to the words of Charlie Sheen. But when Charlie Sheen says, you could ditch too. Why don't you, you know what your problem is you? Why don't you focus more on yourself and less on your brother? It reminds me of that scene with Jesus on the beach where he tells Peter, you're going to be stretched out too. And Peter says, well, what about him? Pointing to the Apostle John. And John says, you need to spend less time worrying about him and you follow me. So Charlie Sheen, echoing the words of Jesus, I don't know about that. But it's really, it's not, it's not fair. It's not fair. And we'll see here at the last minute. In this last scene, Ferris, of course, is having so much fun, he waits till the very absolute last second. And then he has to dash home. He has to run because mom and dad are coming home. He has to get that mannequin out of his bed and get and climb under the covers. Mr. Rooney, the assistant principal, who says, These kids keep me from kids like Ferris keep me from properly governing the student body. He's there busting Ferris. And we'll see that Jeannie is racing home to bust Ferris, because Ferris deserves to get caught. And as we're looking at this in the movie, <clears throat> of course we're rooting for Ferris. But at the same time, in the back of our mind, the movie isn't going to really have a great ending if Ferris just runs into the house, dives under the covers, and everyone is none the wiser. He gets away with everything, and poor Jeannie gets in trouble. We need to have some reframing, and we need to have an out. And this actually does tie back to our parable. I know what's wrong. Next one. Thank <laughs> you. 
I don't normally play that many movie clips, but it's a holiday weekend. I thought we'd kind of have some fun. <laughs> Maybe I'm reading too much into this, but this is what, this is the weird thing, at least about this pastor. I don't read the lectionary reading on Sunday because as soon as I do for the next weekend, I'm on the clock. My head, my, I'm starting to think about the lectionary reading. And I woke up at two o'clock in the morning. I was like, oh my gosh, Ferris Bueller, this is perfect. We need something to save the story though, don't we? We need something to save us from this parable where Jesus just leaves us hanging about the first will be last and the last will be first. And maybe this is part of the moral of the story, or as Paul Harvey said, the rest of the story, is how does Jeannie reframe this so that Ferris, so that we don't have to watch Ferris get away with it and her get in trouble. And we also really kind of, we don't want to see Ferris get busted and have to be with Mr. Rooney for a year. Jeannie somehow is able to reframe this, isn't she? Whether she feels sorry for Ferris or whether she comes to the realization that it's maybe it's not all about her. She's able to, to help Ferris back into the house. She takes one for the team and she reframes this whole thing. And maybe that's part of what Jesus is telling us in this parable as I start to wrap this up. Nope. What's so interesting, the way we hear this parable, is where do you hear, where are you in line when you listen to this? Most of us, I bet, would say, that's not fair. And why do we say it's not fair? Because we sort of assume that we're close to the front of the line, don't we? We sort of assume that those people towards the back of the line don't deserve what we get because we're the right sort. We came to church on Labor Day weekend. Look at all those people that didn't come. We sort of assume that we're kind of towards the front of the line. Maybe another part of this parable is we shouldn't assume that that's what's important to God. God is not fair, apparently. And part of the lesson is that we have to not only get used to it, but we have to almost sort of embrace it. Those people that don't belong, those people down the street that worship God in a different way, those people that don't do it right, that don't believe what we do, guess what? At the end of the day, we don't get to hoard wealth while they go hungry 
in the kingdom of heaven, everyone gets in just enough to eat for that day. So I wrap this up. Like Jeannie, we need to reframe how we think about this parable and how we think about God and how we think about justice. If you're like me, this parable is frustrating, but probably one day, I, like many others, will be very grateful and thank heavens that God is not just a God of fairness, God is not just a God of justice, but God is a God of generosity. Amen.